Um, it's an incredible pleasure and honor to have with us Thierry Amoné to please tell us about curiosity, chance, risk-taking, and caring mentors, also known as living histories. Uh, thank you so much for the, the invitation. It's a really pl a great pleasure to, to be able to participate. Um, so I, thinking about what I would want to say, I kind of like thought about what had been important uh, for my path. And really, uh, I think those words I put in the title is, is I'm going to come back to them at the end, but it's probably the most important for me is the caring mentors and also the interaction with mentees and other colleagues, uh, as others already mentioned. Okay, so um, I grew up in a little town in Switzerland at the border between France, Italy, and Switzerland, right in the mountains. And uh, so there's so many mountains around that basically uh, go out in my backyard and this is what I see. And so I spend my time basically in those mountains. Um, and uh, most of my focus as a, as, a, as a kid and through high school was rock climbing. And rock climbing is amazing. It, you know, it trains you to plan ahead, to take calculated risk. Uh, to be resilient, to keep focus. It's very adventurous. Um, you know, you get confidence in yourself. Basically, it's awesome. I keep, I, I'm still doing it. And um, and then um, once I graduated, I, I finished high school, I went to, to the ETH in Zurich to study physics. And that was actually uh, a tough time because first of all, I am, you know, from the French speaking part of Switzerland. And so everything was in German and also was kind of very lonely uh, because unlike in, in, in the U S uh, over there, when you go to, to university, you basically go to this big town, you rent a room somewhere in the town. And then on day one of the classes, you just go to a big class where there's a lot of people, but there's no college residence and things like that. Like, uh, kids have here in, in the universities. But um, that's also where I met the first person who actually took a chance with me. That's Sami Solanki, a very dynamical person who uh, now is actually a director of an MPI uh, for solar, solar physics. And at the time he said, hey, why don't you do your master thesis in solar physics and, uh, you know, I'm going to send you to the Canary Islands, a tropical island on the west of uh, Africa. And you're going to go and measure the magnetic field on the sun. It was like, yeah, great. This is sounds very interesting and so on. And so off I go. And I spend like a month up on the mountain looking at the the surface of the sun with a massive telescope and trying to measure the intensity of the magnetic field um, on the on that surface, and that was very inspiring. And so later on, uh, after I got my my degree, I I actually stayed in the Canary Islands because I met uh, Fernando Moreno Insertis, who's an amazing advisor and became my PhD advisor. And with him, I did a, I did a, a thesis in theoretical astrophysics. Uh, the question was, well, how, how is it possible that the magnetic field that is generated inside the, the, the sun is able to rise to the surface of the sun to give rise to the sunspot that you see here on the left? You know? And uh, what we found was that those magnetic fields are twisted. And so there's a tangential side of the magnetic field that act like uh, its tension act like a uh, a protection to uh, the the magnetic flux tube that is rising through the convection zone, so it doesn't get shredded by convection, and that's how those magnetic flux tube can rise to the surface. So then, because of that, those were cool results and so on. So I got an uh, offers to go do a postdoc in in the U.S. So I moved to Boulder, Colorado, to do a postdoc, and there life threw me a curveball. A few months after I arrived, uh, the father of my partner, who was still back in Tenerife, passes away. And um, basically, I 
had to eventually cancel the second year of my postdoc to return to Tenerife. And uh, I went there and then things went south and eventually I went a break up with my partner. So now I'm in that island. I don't have a job. So I called back Tom Bogdan. He said, well, I don't have the position anymore, but, you know, let me see what I can do. And so he and uh, Fernando, my other, my other mentor, basically managed to arrange for me to return to Boulder for a couple for a couple months. And then I had received before an offer to be a postdoc at the University of Chicago from Fausto Cataneo. So eventually I, I made my way to the University of Chicago where I worked with Fausto Cataneo also on the interaction between magnetic field and uh, convection in the sun. But uh, at the University of Chicago, uh, my scientific universe got expanded very much because specifically mostly because of this seminar series called Computation in Science Seminar that Leo Kadanov had started and also my conversation with him and others in the department. And uh, this, this seminar series is really amazing. Um, it takes place every week. Uh, it's a discussion over lunch and the topics are ranging all over the places, but they always relate to a dynamical understanding of of what's going on. So, for example, this, in 1999, there were talks about crumpled sheets, uh, how the heart beats, uh, Rayleigh Taylor instabilities, Maxwell's demon in sand piles, optimization and uncertainty, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Genes regulation, uh, elasticity of the DNA by John Marco, and so on. And so that really pushed my understanding of what what one can do with a degree in physics and what with this with uh the approach that we use in physics we can actually address a lot of questions uh you know in many different fields and so that eventually led me to sit in the back of the class from philip cluzel who was at the time an assistant professor and he was giving this he had this class about the key papers in biology. And it was really fascinating because every paper he chose, his analysis of the paper was always about explaining how cells compute, how they make decisions, how they tell time, et cetera, how they find the middle, uh, how DNA replication works, et cetera. So it was always a connection between the molecules and eventually the function through some sort of dynamics. And so I was so enthusiastic by that, that I asked him if I could actually join his lab. And the problem is that, you know, switching from astrophysics to biology, you need to find money to do that. And so we didn't have money to pay for me. And so I went to see my other uh, PI in astrophysics, Bob Rosner, who at the time was also the director of Argonne National Labs. And he told me, well, why don't you apply for a seed grant that the University of Chicago has to uh, to do things between Argonne and the University of Chicago. So I applied for that. Uh, and eventually they, they gave me the money. So I was able to decide, okay, let's I'm going to switch my career from theoretical astrophysics to biology. But it was a kind of a crazy move because, you know, I had been... Already five years after my PhD, I had published eight papers, first auto papers in astrophysics. I was about to apply for a faculty position. No? And now I'm like switching to this thing where I don't know really anything. It's all on soft money. And uh, I was about to get married. And basically a year later, I would, you know, I would have a kid on the way. So anyway, I just went for it. And uh, with Philippe, he we asked the question like where does individuality comes from in bacteria so this is how really he he attracted me to my lab he said well i'm asking where does individuality comes from and i thought that that was a fascinating question and so we looked at the behavior of e coli bacteria uh, when they are swimming in a uniform environment really where there's no signal that they can follow and we measured the fluctuation in the behavior of those cells together with uh, a graduate student in his lab, uh, 
uh, Ekaterina Korobkova. And uh, what we discovered together was that uh, the behavior of the cells exhibited very large fluctuation at a very long time scale. And so the question was, where does it come from? And we realized it actually was coming from the signaling pathway. So that was fascinating because basically we have this, uh, this organism that has a sensory system that generates so many fluctuation that it affects the actual swimming behavior of, uh, of the system. And then we realized that actually this is good for the cell to explore space and so on. And, uh, but, okay, so that was a success story. We published a big paper and then I published another bunch of paper. But uh, after two years, and then they extended it exceptionally for a third year because we had a nice result. But after three years, the grant was done. And again, there was no money. And I still, you know, I was just three years in biology. So then I had to teach uh, for two years to in order to pay for my salary. And uh, I was lucky enough that the University of Chicago had just gotten some HHMI money for teaching. So I built this new course from scratch, basically, about computational biology, which there was no course like that at the University of Chicago. And so I, I, I taught that course for two years. And that was good because then when I applied for faculty position, basically, I had something to say also about teaching. And so then I applied and the Department of Molecular Cellular and Developmental Biology at Yale University offered me a position, which was... Uh, also quite risk-taking from them, from their perspective, you think about it. Um, but uh, that, that department had this fantastic collaborative environment. And so as soon as I arrived, I started to collaborate with plenty of people like Christine Jacob Wagner on microbiology, Scott Hawley on development, and uh, also mostly with us in the long term with John Carlson, who was who is an expert in 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 olfaction of insects, and uh, so John was very generous. Uh, he allowed me to use a, a rig, an electrophysiology rig, in his lab, and my idea was well, I study chemical sensing with bacteria. I can use the same type of approach to study chemical sensing in olfactory receptor neuron, which are the neuron that insect use to detect chemicals. And uh, at that point, uh, just had that ID, but had done anything yet. Carlotta Martelli contacts me. So Carlotta Martelli was a graduate student in Italy and her husband had just gotten a postdoc position at Yale. And so she wanted to come to Yale too. So she wrote to me and say, well, you know, I'm, I'm finishing my theoretical physics uh, PhD uh, I've never done an experiment, but I'd like to do some experiment. And um, so I talked to her and then say, well, why not? And I told her we could take a risky chance. We could try to start to do stuff in neuroscience, which I've never done. But, you know, maybe we can do the same type of experiment we do in Nikolai and discover some cool, some interesting thing. And she decided to go for it. And she really... Start initiated all the research on fly olfaction in my lab. So again, that was a big risk to take, but it led to plenty of results. And uh, lately, most very recently, one thing that is interesting is that my background in fluid mechanics has come back. For example, a postdoc in my lab has built this assay, which is a wind tunnel for walking flies, in which you can see flies navigating an odor plume. And the nice thing about it is that you can see the odor simultaneously with the behavior of the fly. And so it's, it's, what we tried to do initially was a von Karman street, which is the type of eddy shedding that you see behind like a cylinder in a, in a, in a, fluid, in a, in a fluid mechanic experiment. But so eventually we, we built this and, and this enabled us to study many things uh, in olfaction, uh, you know, over the past ten, you know, several years. So, the all of that to say that basically, our you know, throughout through, throughout my entire career, basically, I've I have always uh, benefited from this interaction with people from 
that coming from different background. And um, so eventually, once we were at Yale and um, with different colleagues, we were we 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 managed to convince uh, the provost and the president and so on to when to build a, a new institute called the Quantitative Biology Institute. The idea being that uh, it would be a, a place for people who are in physics, in chemistry, in engineering, evolutionary biology, biology, et cetera, to basically uh, attack problems together. And uh, they, they went for this. And so uh, we have now a new institute in quantitative biology uh, at, at, at Yale University. And uh, all of this really, if you think about it, has only been possible, not just really not, not because of me, but mostly because of the people in the lab, because they are the one who always take risk. So, you know, once you're a professor and you're tenure, the risk level for you is much lower than your graduate student, your undergrads, your postdocs, and so on. And really, the people who are doing the work in the lab are, are these people. And I agree with uh, what the previous speaker was saying, is that the, the, the most difficult thing really is to align money with ideas and people because basically um, you want the people in your lab to be free to explore new direction like Carlotta did, no? But you need to have the money for that. So typically you have to use some money you already have to enable that freedom. So really the academic system is built upside down in, 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 in terms of uh, you know, discovery or promoting discovery. And um, if there's one thing I learned through all these paths is that really taking risk is very important. You also have to be lucky and sometimes you're not lucky, but when you're not lucky, if you have caring mentors, then everything is going to be okay. So relationships are very important. And now as a mentor of people in a lab, it's very important for me that all of their, you know, future life are successful. Are successful. So I try to, to, to really think about their career rather more than than my career, like Tom Bogdan did for me, or Fernando Fernando Moreno Insertis did did for me. And so with that, um, I'll finish here. Oh, by the way, my lab so has bacteria and flies. So we work on two systems, which also some, some kind of crazy thing to do, but it's a lot of fun. So we keep on doing it. And thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Thierry. On behalf of the audience, I'm clapping. In the interest of time, I'm going to ask you a very short question and then wrap the recording. Uh, which is you talked about so many different um, episodes where one could say you made a very courageous choice. Um, and the flip side of courage, of course, is that things may not work out in the best case scenario that you imagine. So I wonder if you would share with us if at different stages you thought about, well, what if this doesn't work out and I have to leave academia? And did you imagine living alternate histories outside of academia? Yes, absolutely. So actually, um, when, when I decided to switch, I told myself, okay, um, I really want to try this. If it works, it's going to make my life super exciting. And if I don't try it, basically, I'm going to be asking myself the rest of my life, oh, you know, wouldn't that have been really interesting? Or, And so I think that on the one hand side, you can see it as taking a risk. The other side is you can just seeing at, you know, living a life that is exciting and um it's you, you cannot really plan everything ahead. 
So you you basically follow in your instinct, your your heart. And I think that's you know what what will keep you going in my in, in my opinion. Thank you. Music to my ears. On that note, I'm closing the recording.